All right, welcome everyone to another edition of Lead More Live, where we do weekly live content here on a Zoom call. Can be watched later, of course, on recording if you're watching this on record, uh, where we bring in great leaders to talk about what it means to be a leader, tactics, um, strategies, tough situations that they've had to handle and learn from. And I'm really excited about today's Lead More Live. Uh, David was a, or, it's kind of weird, was a guest, but isn't live yet. You're going to go out next week. So your episode will go live a week from tomorrow, I think August 13th. Um, so if you're watching this today, it actually, you have not been a guest yet, but we had an awesome conversation. And in that conversation, um, I asked, what are you reading? And then you kind of suddenly were like, well, I typically read about 330 books a year, which is a very specific number. <laughs> um, and I, I couldn't like, it kind of floored me, and, but it was at the end of the podcast and I tried to make a commitment to being a roughly around 45 ish minutes, 50 minutes on the podcast episode. And I knew that was a whole nother conversation. So <laughs> that's what we're here to do today. And I should back up by introducing you. You are a professor at Augustana University. Um, right. Tell me all the different topics you've taught. Well, I'm, uh, I'm chair of the Department of Religion, Philosophy, and Classics, and I teach all of those things. So I, I teach, uh, largely, uh, I teach philosophy classes, philosophy of religion, but I also teach some ancient uh, thought. I teach classical Greek language. I'm also the director of the Environmental Studies program that we just founded. So I teach a lot of classes in environmental studies, both here okay. on, on campus and afield, you know, teaching and what in, is, in rainforests. That you just founded that, what year did that start? 2020. Oh, brand new. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yep. Fun. And so what does that look like as, uh, what, as, as that unfolds and that builds? So now I can come to Augustana and major in environmental studies, essentially? That's right. Yeah. Yep. And uh, it's an interdisciplinary major. So it's not just environmental science. It's for people who want to become environmental historians, environmental journalists. Uh, you know, if you want to become somebody who uh, is going to be a, an energy consultant or an environmental lawyer, and we've got tracks for each of those. Sure. Perfect. Yep. Well, um, you are, where are you right now? You're not in I'm office, in my office at this Augustana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know you've talked about your tea and you've talked about your lazy boy, but you also yeah. clearly have a few books in your office as well. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I'll give you a quick pan around. Okay. Okay. There we go. You have a nice large office. I like it. Oh, uh, all the I, tea. I wow. em embarrassingly at large. Yeah. So there's the tea with, uh, you know, with the, the taxonomy of teas here, so students know when they walk in the door over there that they're right next wait, wait, to the go, high caffeine stuff. Go back for a second. You have the classic, my favorite. Oh, okay, okay. I thought the round, the little square where it says soothing, you maybe had save. Remember in high school when like, oh. the, the, <laughs> the teacher would write save so that the janitor <laughs> wouldn't erase it? <laughs> no, thankfully nobody comes in here and erases this because I leave all kinds of stuff up here. But. Yeah, so it's, I, I want people to feel free to come in and have a cup of tea and then browse the books. Uh, cool. And then got the lazy boy over here so that somebody, my students can come in and just sit and read a book for a while while I'm sitting over here working at my computer, or working at my standing desk, which is where you've got so, me right now. That's great. And are these books uh, like your all time hits? Are these ones related to class? What What's on the shelf? Yeah, I think of this, this office as being uh, partly a toolbox and partly like a wunderkammer or, a, a, you know, a, what do you call like a shadow box, you know, a place where you put that, put in all the things that help you to think or that remind yep. you of important things. So cool. it's teaching tools. All right. Well, let's dive in and unpack. So you made this comment and then afterward, which we weren't on recording, I wish we would have been, you told me a little bit about how you read and yeah. um, gosh, it's, I don't think that all leaders have to be, uh, readers, but I think it, I think there was a quote uh, that we put in. I'm trying to remember who said this, but all readers are leaders, uh, and I, I thought that was really good. And so, um, yeah, I think you know, reading opens our our eyes and our, our our ears and our brains to to new things and new worlds, both fiction and nonfiction. And I know you read both. So tell me, I guess maybe to start, why why do you enjoy reading so much? You know, I'm not sure if I can answer that one really quickly. Uh, I, I know that I do enjoy reading a lot. I have been a reader all my life. Maybe, my, you know, my mom read to me when I was too young to be able to recognize letters, and uh, I've been a reader ever since. It, it certainly, as you see, it, it helps me. These are, this is my, almost like my externalized memory here. So um, the, the books connect me to a long conversation. They're, they're, some of the books here physically 
are a couple hundred years old. But as far as when they were first written, several, several of them, quite a few of them are several thousand years old. So oh, I wow. feel like I'm in the company of people who've been thinking similar thoughts for a long time and trying to improve on those thoughts over time. Well, Augustana knows you can't go anywhere because you got too many books to carry with you, right? <laughs> you, can't never, you can never move. <laughs> this is my anchor. <laughs> I always feel like when you move, like, a, you know, moving college or apartment, like, like that was always the heavy box. It was like the book box. They're so dang heavy. When I moved here from Pennsylvania, I sold 40 boxes of books to the local used bookstore. It was rough. But we oh. brought another, I think, 80 or 90 boxes with us. So, yeah. So before we dig into the how, I always like to know, like, um, how you choose what you're going to read next. Um, are you a person yeah. who, do you keep a cue? Do you, do you ask for recommendations? How do you decide what you want to read? I do ask for recommendations sometimes, but people tend to recommend more books than I could possibly read. Uh, what I like to do is let one book lead to the next one. As I'm reading a book, something will spark my curiosity. I make a note. Usually if with a good book, I'm gonna get a lot of notes like that. Something is gonna make me wanna learn more. And so I dig in more. Or is that based on I'll, like, go ahead. I'll, well, I'll talk to somebody like you and you'll say, this is what I've been reading recently. And I'll say, oh, that sounds interesting. Tell me more. And if it, if it seems like something where I can learn and I can deepen my own knowledge, then you know, there's a pretty good chance if it comes from a friend or comes from sure. somebody who, who I respect, uh, then I'll dig into that too. So the criteria, you kind of untouched on it there, is if you feel like you can learn or maybe based on the source of the recommendation. Uh, I know like Bill Gates will always write his like books of the year list. Like do you go to any right. of those or? I do, yeah. I, I, I Usually when I look at, uh, at Bill Gates books of the year or some, uh, several of these other prominent lists, I find I've already read quite a few of them and then I'll find one or two like, oh, that's one I need to read as well. Uh, I'm not sure what that says, if that means that I've got too narrow a, a group of people that I'm taking recommendations from or that we, you know, we are similarly minded. I'm not sure. So, yes, a book, yeah. The books as an art feel like music to me, right? There's just, it's that you can never get to the end of, of Spotify. Just like you can never end, like read an right. entire library. And so you have to sort of just accept that you won't get to all of them. Um, that's right. So you, so you choose a book and now I'm going to, I'm going to shut up and let you talk a little bit. Tell me about your process. Cause it's really fascinating. Let me start off just by saying that, uh, some people, when I tell them that I, how many books I read each year, they say, I don't believe you. And that's fine because I'm not <laughs> doing it to impress anybody else. I'm doing it to yep. learn things. And uh, some people say, that sounds really intimidating. There's no way I can do that, especially my students. And I say, that's fine too. Read as many as you find uh, help you. Uh, it, you know, mm -hmm. if you found, if you have a friend who's a marathon runner and you can't run at all, don't feel like you need to be a marathon runner. Just enjoy yeah. the fact that your friend runs a marathon. I can't run at all. I mean, I'm, I'm a terrible runner. I'm a great swimmer, really? so I'm gonna swim. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll run literally dozens of yards a year. So, uh, but, <laughs> but I, I can swim forever, I mean, you know. So we all, we all have different gifts and different interests. If you find a book that you enjoy, and it's helping you, then dig into it and allow yourself that pleasure. I will say though, that some books are like candy, and so you wanna diversify your diet some. And one really good way to do that is to read old books. It, it's not guaranteed, some old books are terrible, but in general, when books stand the test of time, it's, it's uh, in part because a lot of people have read them and said, I learned something from this. This was helpful mm -hmm. and provoked a thought, something like that. So. I teach philosophy. That's my professional training. I, I studied to be a Spanish teacher and then I studied to be a philosophy professor. Teaching philosophy means reading philosophy. It means trying to contribute to philosophy. And you notice if you go to any university that most of the professors are PhDs and the PH stands for philosophy. Philosophers tend to read pretty broadly and we tend to invent sure. new disciplines. So uh, I'm not trained in environmental studies. Uh, except I'm an autodidact. I read a lot and I go out into the field a lot. And part of what I do is uh, I pick up books. So I happen to really love dragonflies. They, dragonflies fascinate mm -hmm. me. This is Kurt Mead's book on dragonflies in the North Woods, third edition. This, the third edition tells you something right there. It's a good book. Kurt Mead's got these fantastic photos of all the dragonflies that you're going to find in our region, in the upper Midwest. That, that's super. This is not the sort of book that I'm going to read cover to cover. Yep. However, 
with any book, I'm going to do some really similar things. I am going to look at the cover. I'm not going to judge the book by the cover. We all know about that. <laughs> I'm going to actually pay attention to some of this stuff that most people don't tend to look at all that quickly. The design of the inside page will tell you something. Um, you go and look at where it was published, who vetted this book, when was it published. Uh, that will often point you to other books. It'll also tell you something about whether other people have weighed this material. And then I spend some time on the table of contents. And when I was a kid, I thought the table of contents was the most boring part of the book. Sure. But here's something that I think is really helpful. Remember that um, while uh, there are lots of kinds of books, in one sense, all books are trying to do the same thing. They're all like a letter that's been written by the author to a potential audience. And some books are very long. Like I've got this great big Greek English lexicon here. Again, I'm not gonna read this thing cover to cover. Um, but it's set up in such a way that somebody like me can find the information that I want. And if I'm looking up a particular mm -hmm. dragonfly, it's color coded. It's color coded on the outside to let me know what I'm looking for. But also he's done some really good things with images. And at the table of contents, he's telling me what is a dragonfly? Dragonfly biology 101, behavior of the winged dragons and so on. So I can go through here really quickly, just spend a little bit of time and say, okay, this is how he's organized his thoughts. And he's telling me how he's organized his thoughts so that I can enter into that and decide, do I want to jump into that right away? Yep. Now, again, this is, so this book I've read, I've read it a couple of times. Uh, and, and by read it, I mean, I've skimmed through each page not reading, I'm not checking his grammar or anything like that. But yeah. this book got me thinking about a bunch of other stuff. And Cindy Crosby just published this book right here, Chasing Dragonflies, A Natural, Cultural, and Personal History. This is a fantastic okay. book. Now, check out the pictures. Completely different kind of book, right? So Cindy Crosby is a naturalist, lives uh, in, in or near Chicago, and she has written about her own experience of looking for dragonflies, understanding what their ecology is and so on. But it's also written for non-specialists. This is something that you can enjoy. Yep. And it happens to be that here in the upper Midwest, we've got a couple of really good poets who have written dragonfly haiku. So we've got Kobayashi Isa, who was a Japanese poet several centuries ago, six centuries ago, something like that. Ken Tennyson and Scott King are upper Midwest poets. And I'm going to show you something. I've showed you how I read Kurt Mead's book, right? This is a pretty quick read, although I've got to tell you, this, there's a little section here on green darner migration. Absolutely fascinating. It's just a couple of pages long. Absolutely worth it. Cindy Crosby's book starts off by talking about her own struggle with cancer and with the healing power of being out in nature. And this is the sort of book you want to read slowly. This book right here, Which is a, so, go ahead, uh, sorry. so this, this one is the, uh, the Dragonfly Haiku. And when I'm reading a book of poetry, again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to open it up. I'm going to look at the design on the inside. I'm going to look at the table of contents. It's telling me these three poets. But with, with poetry, you almost do yourself and the poet a disservice. You definitely do a disservice uh, by just trying to breeze through it because that's not what poetry is for. Poetry is like the most condensed information that needs to be unpacked. So check this out. Here's one of the poems. This one is by uh, Ken Tennyson. The path of a dragonfly cannot be followed. That's it. And you could look at that and say, all right, that's dumb. The path of a dragonfly cannot be followed until you go out with these other two books and you realize it's really hard to follow them around. They move very fast. And then you think about it a little bit longer in the context of haiku, and sort of the spiritual dimension, the spiritual and ethical dimension of haiku, you go, wait a minute, I can't live like a dragonfly. That path that a dragonfly follows through life, I can't quite live that way, why not? Yep. And you can sit with that haiku for a lifetime, or at least you can sit with that haiku for half an hour and dwell on it. And if you have a book of poetry and you, you kind of breeze through it and one of the poems you stop at, especially if it's organized so you can do that, or if you stop at the first poem and, and dwell with it, in some sense, you've read the book and you've also invited yourself to return to it. Mm -hmm. Now, you asked me about my method, though, of reading books in general. So I just wanted to point out, like I said, that there, 
that all books in some sense are there are letters written to a potential uh, audience but they're all written to a different kind of audience and they're written differently so you kind of have to respect that genre and recognize some books you're going to read that haiku and go that's good i'm, I'm going to come back to that tonight uh, or next week and i'm done yep. some books you're going to use as a reference some books you're you know and you just want to know what's in there so i can find it again i don't have all the dragonflies in in Kurt Mead's book memorized. I know where to find them in Kurt Mead's book though. That's so I've read it well enough to know that. And that's what I do with a lot of books. The Cindy Crosby's book, Chasing Dragonflies, what I want to do is what I call the flyover method. Uh, mm -hmm. So with with any book, and, I, and in fact, I don't I don't want to do Cindy uh, a disservice. So I'm going to take, uh, <laughs> I'm going to grab a different book right here. Here's uh, Clayton Christensen's The Innovator's Dilemma. Okay, yep. so uh, Christensen, brilliant author, um, when new technologies cause great firms to fail. All right, so like a headline in a newspaper, he's just told you everything. This is, that's what the book's all about right there. I'm gonna do the same thing I did with the other books. I'm gonna open it up and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time looking at the table of contents. And then let me tell you about my setup where we are right here. I think you can see that I've got a blank pad right here. I hope you can also see that I got a computer over there and the screen is facing the other way. And yeah. if I weren't talking to you right now, I wouldn't have my phone here. In other words, I'm gonna get rid of all of the distractions. I'm standing up. I don't always stand up, but I often stand up when I read because it's almost like a cup of coffee. At times, you, you know, eventually you're gonna get tired and say, that's it, I'm done. And you gotta pay attention to your body because when your body says, I'm done, there's no point in continuing to read. Yeah, so for you, it's not a, it's not a page count. It's probably more about a, a amount of time. That's right, yeah. It, and again, to go back to that exercise uh, analogy, if you said, uh, I saw somebody bench press, uh, you know, 250, I therefore should be able to bench press 250, you might wind up doing yourself some harm, especially if your body is not set up for that. Or you might underdo it if you happen to be a linebacker who can bench 400. So mm -hmm. know yourself, right? I got a pencil. I got a pad of paper. I'm going to get rid of these other three books for right now and just open up Clayton Christensen's book. And what I'm gonna do, you see this okay? Yeah, I think so, yep. Is like I said, I'm gonna call this my flyover method. I got my, my pencil in my writing hand, and more importantly, I'm gonna keep one finger extended. And we can talk more about why that is later if you like, but it's an old tradition. And I am gonna read this whole book. This book is 250 pages or so. I'm gonna read this whole book in about 250 seconds. Don't panic, I am not gonna know what it says at that point. My, what I'm doing here, well, the reason why I, ca I call this the flower method is, imagine that I wanted to introduce you to say the state of Rhode Island and you had one day to get to know it and I gave you the services of a helicopter. Now Rhode Island is small enough that in one day you could take a helicopter and see most of it from the air. And in mm -hmm. one way, you're now gonna know Rhode Island. You'll know its shape, you'll know where the water is, where the land is, where the rivers are, and so on. In another way, you're not gonna know it because you won't have met anybody. Now, if your criterion is memorizing everything that's in a book, well, good luck. You're not gonna do 330 books in a day. You're probably not gonna do 330 books in a lifetime. You might do one book in a lifetime if you're kind of memorized everything. But if your aim is to have a big picture, what's this place like? What's the topography of this book? and mm -hmm. to get to know some of the terrain, some of the people pretty well. That's what this method is for. So it's a three-step method. Okay. Imagine first we fly over Rhode Island. Second, we choose one spot and we land and we get out of the helicopter and walk around for a while, have a meal, talk to some people. Third, we get back in the helicopter, and we take the whole thing in once again. And now we go, oh yeah, that's that place that I had lunch. That's where I went for a swim. Oh, uh, the person that I met lives right over there. Now I put it all mm -hmm. in context. I want to do the same thing with a book. So 250 pages, 250 seconds, I'm giving about a second per page. And all I'm going to get is a rough impression of the lay of the land. That combined with the other things that I mentioned, like the table of contents and the layout. So even when so, you apply this methodology, a second a page is really fast. Like it is, you must like, fast. how do your eyes, yeah, how do your eyes, how do your eyes even grab certain words or you don't? Those of you who are watching, uh, if you're in an, unfamiliar place you can try this after you know, you're done watching this or if you're watching this later on and you're, you can pause the recording and and give this a try look out the window but only allow yourself one second to look out the window and then close your eyes and turn back and see if you can recount what you just saw we have the capacity to take in a tremendous amount of information visually 
really quickly. It's an evolutionary advantage. It's why our species still exists or part of why mm -hmm. our species still exists, right? Uh, and we can make some, some pretty quick judgments about what's there. We're not going to see everything. We know that. There's going to be a lot that's camouflaged. But you can try this too. If you got a book nearby, especially one you haven't read before, open it to yep. any given page. Don't look at it yet. Look at it, look away. Now, I just looked very quickly and I saw digital equipment. So digital equipment, capital D, capital E. What does that tell me? It tells me that at some point in there, he's going to talk about something that has the proper name, digital equipment. And it's probably a company, right? Now, if I do that with every page and I see digital equipment, digital equipment, digital equipment, again and again, I'm going to know he really cares about this digital equipment, whatever this is. And if you glance at a page for one second, you're probably going to come away with four, five, six words. And those things are going to leave an impression on you. Now, there's a danger here. As I'm going through it, I'm going to run my finger down at each page, right? About a second a page. And I might come to something and go, oh, I really want to look at this. I see this interesting chart that Christensen's got. I want to take some time on this. Don't. Not yet. Okay. That's what the pencil's for. And don't underline all kinds of stuff. Don't highlight. Don't make lots of notes. What I do is if I see this one sentence that looks interesting, I make a quick mark right in the margin, just like that. Just to remind myself, that was a spot. Yeah. And I, if, if a book is... Okay, I might wind up with one or two of those marks. If it's fantastic, I might wind up with dozens or scores of those marks. And I'm going to keep going through it. That was the first flyover. Now, the second time through, I, had, I didn't tell myself that I understood the whole thing. I was just trying to get the lay of the land. Now I'm going to go back and I, I'm going to pay attention to where those marks were. I'm going to let myself read a little bit more slowly. But... Really, I'm, it, I'm just kind of going through this fairly quickly and looking for where those marks were. And I might allow myself to go back. What I really want to do is I want to dwell for a little while on one of those places. This is like getting out of the helicopter, meeting somebody, having a meal. Dig into a chapter. Here I'm doing kind of a heuristic process. Do I really care about this book enough? Is it really well written? Does it have the kind of information that I want? If so, I might go back to the beginning when I'm all done with my third pass through and start a slow read. But for now, I did that first read, a second a page. The second read, I'm going to do about a second or a couple of seconds a page, but I'm going to allow myself to stop. I'm still in the helicopter, but I'm going to let the helicopter land in maybe two or three places, tops. And when I've hit three, I'm going to say, that's it. Just go to the end. Go through all to the end. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to give it a third pass. So in the end, I've spent about 750 seconds on this book, maybe a little bit more. And now I've decided, is this a book that merits more of my attention? I've got a big idea of what it's about, but I can't claim any kind of expertise. If it does merit more of my attention, now maybe I'm going to retreat to that lazy boy, or I'm going to stand here and I'm going to say, this book's going to take me a week. So I will add that I read more than one book a day. One book is going to get this treatment. Sometimes eight or nine books are going to get this treatment. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a book on my bedside table that I'm going to read a chapter of before I go to sleep, maybe two or three chapters. There's always going to be a couple of books that I'm going to allow myself just to steep in before I go to work. So normally this desk right here, I spend a little bit of time reading scripture and I spend a little bit of time just thinking about and praying for my students. And that's not something that I need to do. It's not about productivity. It's, if anything, it's almost like breathing. It's about like slowing down and reminding myself, why am I here? What are all these books for? Is there something that I'm about to do that's going to be measured? Well, then let there be something that's going to be measured in a different way. How much do I care about the people around me? How much do I care about my students? And so I'm going to have books for all sorts of different occasions throughout the day. Some books of poetry, some books on leadership, and of course, I'm going to have some professional development books or some books that I'm about to teach. I do have a couple of these here that uh, I teach so the, often. So the three-part the three part flyover method, about a 12-minute-ish, 12, 12 10 to 12 minutes for like your three parts. That's and right. then if you're going to really dive in, either before you know, your nighttime book, I imagine you also read fairly quickly, given just what I know about you and the amount of books that you read. That you get faster the more you read. What would, what would actually diving into that book um, look like then if you were to truly read or what you and I could, or what I consider reading, maybe not you. 
Um, this book happens to be particularly well written. Uh, I really like mm -hmm. uh, Christensen's uh, authorial voice. And so I'm taking time to take in his writing. This book took me probably about an hour and a half to read through cover to cover. Okay. There are two other things that I should say, though, that, that add to that time. Um, one is that as I go through here, I've got this white notepad here. I might jot down a few quick notes. If I, and if I, this note, notepad serves a couple of purposes. If there was something on page 28 that caught my eye, I might say 28 and then a three, four words about what caught my eye. Also, I set aside a column on this, this piece of paper right here for, you know, this happens. You can be doing something important. You can be on a, a date with your beloved and all of a sudden you remember something you have to do at work. And now that's the sure. only thing on your mind dump it so just let yourself give yourself a moment to write it down and now you can forget about it and when you're done at working at your standing desk or sitting in your lazy boy or whatever then you can come back to that column and deal with it but now it's out of your mind it's, it's on the page and the last thing that i'm going to do if the book was especially good is i'm going to take this book over to my computer and i'm going to find a few passages that really stood out to me that i want to be able to teach somebody else that i want to share with somebody else and i'm going to take the time to put down all the bibliographic information and to type out that passage into one single file and i've been keeping this file for 20 years it's a huge file oh, now. No it's easy to search and uh, it's got all kinds of stuff i don't share this file with anybody in case anybody's wondering it's because uh, i put my own personal notes in sure. there and sure. that winds up becoming my books uh, I learned this in part from Ralph Waldo Emerson. I've got a, a handful of Emerson's notebooks over here. And Emerson kept books like this right here where he would write down his random thoughts, things that he read in books. And when he gave lectures, when he gave presentations, sermons, or when he wrote books, he would open up those books and copy things out because it was already done. So I'm actually doing a tremendous amount of, of work right here. The books that I have written, or the books that I've contributed to, written, published three, four, written, con or contributed to another 15 or so sure. books. It all starts right here. Reading, making notes, putting it onto the computer, and now that's ready to just cut and paste, to share with other people as they find, as I find something that's helpful for them. And I've got the bibliographic information, which I used to hate when I was a kid. Like, why did teachers make me do bibliographies? And then I realized oh, yeah. it's so that I can help other people find the same thing. So I love, a couple of things I love about that. One, I love the almost the for, the forcing function of like, I'm going to take three things from this book. And even if you've, once you've gotten them, even if there might be some of the gems in the back half of the book, you just, you move on. It's in, it's almost like a forcing function to like, there's only so much you can pull from a book and teach your students anyway. So if you get three things, right. you're doing great. <laughs> that's right uh, how, exactly how do you the other part i love about that and this is one of the best tips i probably became more of a true reader six or seven years ago when and i, I i'm you know i think the most books i've ever read are in the low 40s in a year so not even close but um sure. was when someone gave me the permission to quit a book uh and i remember yes. someone gave me the tip of like it was like this you know, this idea of sunken cost, where we really are hooked on it as, as Americans. It's like, well, I've started it, so I got to finish it, right? And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, even if you're like 20% of the way through, you know, there, there's even for you at 3.30 a year, you still won't be able to read all the books, not even close. So no. this idea of, of quitting a book, I think is okay, giving yourself permission to move on, that maybe there was only one or two things for you in that book to begin with. That's right. Yeah, John, I'll take it a little bit further. I said that I've uh, written four books uh, and I've added to, you know, contributed chapters to 15 books or so. I have started writing a dozen other books and I've gotten partway into it and realized I don't really want to write this book. <laughs> and I abandon it. And on Do you even happens, go as far as doing like a, an outline or what did you just set, like opened a Word document and started writing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got a book that I wrote, uh, what, eight chapters of it, something like that, uh, on philosophy of religion. And I thought, I don't really want to finish this. There's other things that are more interesting to me right now. But every time I do that, I don't like how I don't have like a formal burning ceremony or, you know, delete the file. I keep it all. <laughs> and very often I'll find a few years later that 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 those notes become something that helped me to teach somebody or a 
paragraph that was in there that was really quite good winds up becoming part of another essay or something like that. Sure, yeah. sure. The other, so the, yeah, the two tips I wanted to share, you you have loads of them, was the ability to, or the freedom to quit a book, a book. And then I also was taught reading multiple books at once uh, is really yeah. powerful because, you know, I've, we haven't even gotten to fiction yet. I want to ask you about fiction, but uh, sometimes, you know, reading it, I read probably a lot of business books, but I also like biographies of leaders. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, reading Lincoln's, you know, uh, team of rivals from Doris Goodwin Kearns at 10, 15 p.m. when you're trying to fall asleep isn't probably the right book. Uh, so kind right. of knowing, and I, I even think of that with, I wanted to ask you about audio because I kind of, that was a big unlock for me was I like to run. And so once I started listening, listening to books, right. I started getting a lot more, but I've found there are, there are right books for audio and, and, and some that are not. So I usually have one on audio. I have a hard copy on my book, on my bedside. And then even like the Kindle, if I'm, you know, on a flight and I don't want to bring that big heavy book, I grab the Kindle. Do you, so are you also tackling multiple? Obviously you are, if you're doing several a day. Yeah, uh, so I, I will bring the Kindle backpacking with me sometimes so that I can bring multiple books with me. Uh, I read Jane Austen while I was up above the Arctic Circle one time, hanging out in a in a, a tent and the, the sun wasn't going down. So I, I just thought, well, I'm going to read Jane Austen for a while. And just, <laughs> it was pretty fantastic. Um, I don't uh, I don't tend to do audio except no. I said before I wasn't a runner, but during the current craziness of uh, coronavirus I actually have become a little bit of a runner and podcasts okay. have become huge for me during uh, during running so yeah that's uh, I, I'm the same way or if I'm going on a long drive but I, so, I also uh, um, I okay. value my silence as well so you know just being able to to be quiet and then to try to even still my my inner life I find if I can get my body to stop moving uh, I can pay attention to what's still moving inside of me so, but that's, that's a quirk of my own that might not be relevant to, to other people. So you touched on, I sometimes feel like with podcasts, uh, I never know what to choose in terms of the media between reading the news, a podcast and a book. I, I, I like to yeah. default to books because in my head, I think, okay, this was the author's most proud piece of work. They spent the most time, the most blood, sweat, and tears time. But man, there's a lot of great podcasts out there too. So how do you kind of weigh your time? And I think that's why I wanted you to come on and do this because there's there's not enough time. So how can we get through? It's not about it's not about getting the longest list or saying I read a hundred books, but it's about learning and growing. And so how do you manage how do you manage between those different sources? Because I know you're a news person too. I am, yeah. News junkie. Uh, like I said before about diet, I think it's important to pay attention to you know your, your body and the, your need for a diverse diet. I think it's important to do the same thing with your mind and with your heart. Um, I'm a, I'm a, a, a scholar of Plato, uh, this not not Plato, but you know Plato, you know, and uh, and Plato has this idea that we are <laughs> complex beings, and each part of us needs some nourishment, even some intellectual nourishment. So. Um, I think this is part of why I read some poetry each day. It's why I read some scriptures. Uh, it's why I read something that, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to business school, um, but I'm still fascinated by other people's world. And I often find that if I read something like Clayton Christensen, I realize, oh, he's actually got something to say to me. Or there's another one that I'll recommend to your, um, your viewers. This is Jocelyn Davis's the greats on leadership. Uh, and this Perfect. is classic wisdom from Lincoln, Austin, Lao Tzu, and many more. So this is like really short chapters on great philosophers and novelists and so on that help with leadership. Uh, that, you know, so it, I think just as somebody who lives outside of my realm can teach me something about philosophy, somebody who lives in the philosophical or the poetic realm can teach me something about leadership or about business, et cetera. That's great. I'm going to add that one to my list. Um, so to those on the chat, we will open it up for questions. I have one and then we'll open it up if anybody has any. Um, tell me about fiction. Do you do the flyover method on fiction? Because when you were describing that, my head was like, well, that'll ruin right. the ending, right? Like, yeah. so how does that approach? The, the only, no, in general, I don't. Uh, I, I might if I had to teach something um, very quickly. Uh, when I was a substitute teacher years ago for a high school in New Mexico, 
I got assigned a, a book that I had to I had to teach the next day. So yeah, I did the flavor <laughs> method there. And you're right, it's just it's ugly. That's about recognizing the different languages that people are speaking and the different ways in which people are speaking. You, it would be like, um, I don't know, saying to your, uh, your beloved that you want to go on a date, but you don't want it to last more than a few seconds. Uh, a date is something to be savored, right? Um, yep. So I think with, wine. with, yeah, right. I'm going to drink the wine quickly and then I'm, and then I'm out of here, but you were great. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's not much of a date. And I think that with fiction, there's something about the crafting of the words that really, really matters. Whereas some of the books that I read on, uh, on leadership or on business, um, they're not trying to be poets and they're not trying to, in general, they're not trying to be storytellers, although they're often telling anecdotes. They're trying to get to a point and trying to get you there fairly quickly. And then maybe tr to give you some illustrations of what that would look like. So, and you, we can learn a lot from, from that cool. with their conciseness. Well, we have uh, Dylan, Jay, JR, Stacy, Nick, whoever, if you have a chat, a uh, question for David, Professor O'Hara, put it in the chat. Um, you know, one thing I think this would be really applicable to is uh, Dr. Barry Dunn, the, the president of SDSU. He told me one time, I was actually in Leadership South Dakota, and he spoke to us, and he talked about what he called the airport books, which are mm -hmm. the ones when you're in an airport and you walk by, and it's kind of like the latest business book or something you might be the New York Times bestseller. Uh, I used to read a lot of those, you know, I'm thinking of like right. Tim Ferriss's four hour work week or, uh, right. you know, something like that. Good books. There's usually a lesson, but they're often really repetitive. And actually usually by about 30, 40, 35, 40% of the book, you kind of got the concept down. And so this would be really applicable. And, uh, Barry yeah. Dunn talked about it. read about people, read about heroes, like biographies, autobiographies, presidents, uh, philosophers. Right. That's where you really learn a lot. Like, Everything you need to know, and we talked about this on our podcast episode that'll drop, is like how much we can learn from classics and from history. Right. And having published a number of books, I can tell you that there's a business to books, uh, and publishers want them to be a certain length, which means mm -hmm. that if I've got an idea that really is for a tiny book, a publisher will ask me to expand it uh, because people often will perceive the value in, in, in the thickness of the book. They, you know, they are judging the book, not necessarily by the cover, but maybe by its heft. Yeah, that's so funny. So you're right. Some of those books, you know, do the flyover method the first time through and you'll go, oh, this guy is saying the same thing again and again and again. And you can figure that out in a matter of seconds often. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where I think podcasts or even like uh, on Medium, sometimes you can find a really great long form essay or something like that, which right. probably got the point faster than needing to write a whole book. And I'm guessing as an author, you, you probably like to do that sometimes. Maybe you'd rather just write an essay. Absolutely. I thought about writing a book on the ethics of artificial intelligence uh, as it pertained to religion. And then I realized I can just write a couple of essays on Medium. And uh, I yeah. did so. They, they were, you know, a thousand words each or something like that. It's not particularly long. I feel like I made my point and I'm done. Now I'm moving on to other sure. stuff. That's great. Well, if, uh, if anybody has a question, make sure you jump in. This is your time now to, uh, to, to ask uh, David. So, oh, there they go. They plopped in. So um, Nick asked, do you reread a book? You talked about you going through the three times. And yeah, what is the criteria to choose? So some of the books, you know, I mentioned that there's a, there's a difference of, uh, of style and voice and some books become friends. I mean, I got, I forget, I got a couple of thousand books in this office and I returned to lots of these books, not just because I teach them, but because um, just like with that, uh, that dragonfly haiku, the way of the, the path of the dragonfly cannot be followed. It's just a few words, but each time I return to it, I find myself reflecting on it in, in a different way. There are books like, uh, I held up this one before, uh, Plato's Republic. Um, this book has, I mean, this book shaped Thomas Jefferson and it shaped Thomas Hobbes. It shaped the society we live in. And I don't think I've exhausted it yet. Every time I return to it, I wind up learning more, which is why I got all these post-it notes. And in this mm -hmm. book, I have begun to underline passages and I've written notes at the top of pages and so on. In a sense, I get to the point where I feel like I'm having a conversation with Plato. Uh, it's, so yeah, I do return to books like that. Cool. I don't know if Clayton Christensen uh, and I will get like that. <laughs> you have a seen a dial. You played it. You played it. No, 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 yeah, and, and and you know, no, no, no intention to uh, to criticize him. You know, just I'm not sure that we uh, will ever 
need to have that conversation, put it that way. Well, I imagine too, we talked about this on your podcast. I've, I, I've got to know you through students and, and students talk about how much they enjoy your classes. And I imagine, especially a school like Augustana, liberal arts school where uh, you teach people of all majors, reading a book like Innovations or Innovator's Dilemma, it, it allows you to connect to your students because they have different interests and you could pull up a quote right. or hey, I heard that Amazon was doing this. And then they were like, well, we just learned about that in our management class, you know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, years ago, I was teaching the philosophy of religion and uh, we were talking about Marx, uh, Freud, and Nietzsche. And each one of them refers to religion as being like the OPM of the masses. And I had nursing students in this one class. I think I had seven nursing students in there. And one of them said, I figured it out. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means that it needs to be dosed properly. And I'd never heard anybody say that before. And I thought, this is fantastic. Hmm. I need to learn more about this. And these students are the ones with whom I can have this conversation and begin to learn. So yes, absolutely. That's great. Uh, we're coming up on time, but Jade asked the perfect like stumper question that I'm sure you probably okay. hate. But she <laughs> said, hard question, but do you have an all-time favorite book that has changed your life or encouraged you to maybe pursue your career as a, as a teacher? It's uh, actually not too hard. I don't know if I have an all-time favorite, but, uh, oh, maybe I brought it home. No, this is, uh, oh, no, I did bring it home. Um, this, is, uh, this is what happens when uh, we're living in this, this time of coronavirus. I have a copy of, of um, Plato's, the, um, oh, here it is. I moved it over to this stack. This right here. Plato's The Last Day of Socrates. This is a Penguin edition. I got this for 25 cents at a garage sale back when I was about well, look, uh, 11 years old. And, looks well uh, used. I, yeah. And I saw the name Plato and Socrates, and I knew nothing about these guys, except that I'd heard their names before, and they sounded important. And so I started to read, and I didn't understand exactly what was going on, because I was like 11 or 12 years old. <laughs> but I was really drawn into this guy, Socrates, and the way that he thought. And he made me a better mathematician. Uh, it was right around then that I was starting to, to learn geometry, and I started to understand what was going on. And as it turns out, I became a Plato scholar years later, many years later. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this one, I, this is one of the few books in my office that I particularly cherish. I love it. A quarter at a garage sale. Yeah, yeah. Power, that's the power of a book right there. That's right. That's so great. That's, right. That's so great. Um, well, if there's any other questions, otherwise, um, I guess as you ran around the corner there, I thought of one more. Uh, how do you Good. organize your, shel your shelves there? Because you seem to know exactly where to go look. Yeah, I have a fun game that I play with my students. Uh, I'll bring them in here and, and uh, I'll close my eyes and say, you pick out a title and I'll point to it. Obviously, right now, since I've been moving stuff around, I'm a little bit off. Um, but uh, there, this is actually, uh, there's a couple of books right over here that, uh, that talk about this. I've got uh, Francis Yates's uh, The Art of Memory and uh, The Medieval Craft of Memory. Joshua Four uh, wrote a book about this as well, Moonwalking, uh, was it Moonwalking with Einstein. I think that was it. Oh, that's a um, great one. Yeah. Yeah. So these are, it's about the idea of a memory palace. So I, yes, I do have this organized and it's hard to explain how it's organized to anybody else, except that there are connections between any two books on the shelves makes their connection makes sense to me. And the way that Joshua Four explains it, I think is really helpful. If you remember your childhood bedroom or if you moved around mm -hmm. a lot, just the one where you maybe spent the most time, you probably remember just where the furniture was and that's how it is here too. So mostly well, uh, done chronologically by subject. He talks about how you can use a memory palace even to, um, you know, remember your grocery list. And so you, you think about your bedroom and to the left is a desk and that's like the asparagus. And then on top of the desk was your little uh, autographed baseball by Kirby Puckett. And that's the, the strawberries. And like you can put these yep. things in your memory palace and that's and then you walk through it and remember everything. It's pretty fascinating. Exactly. And he was using a method that Cicero or somebody going by the name of Cicero described. Uh, in a text that's 1800 years old, no longer than uh, 2000 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is great. And I think some people, in, you know, here in the lead more community might be like, well, what does this have to do with, with being, you know, a, a leader or a CEO or a president or a, whatever your title is? Well, one, you know, our philosophy here is that all people are leaders and can be leaders. 
But two, I think uh, like one of the consistent threads I've met about the, the greatest leaders I know is they're always pushing themselves to learn and pushing themselves to get better. And I think as you illustrated today, there is no better vehicle than a good book. It certainly helps. Yeah. I, I like being able to gather together things, not just to make me richer, but to make other people richer. As I said before, you come in the door, you grab some biscotti, a cup of tea, sit in the chair. I want to share this wealth with my students. So if you're a leader, you're gathering information so that you can pass on what you've gained to other people. This is a great long conversation we're engaged in. And right now we're just reading one chapter of it aloud. I love it. Well, thanks, David, for your time. We uh, will put this recording Thank up you, in the John. community. And if anybody wants it, they can rewatch it. And uh, to everyone else in the community, we'll be back next week, next Wednesday, with another Lead More Alive. So thanks for joining us today. Take care, everyone. Thanks. And feel free to buy my books if you want. <laughs> How do we buy your book? Uh, Amazon, I guess, I'm guessing. Am yep. Yeah. Sold the quality and, books uh, sellers everywhere. OK, perfect. All right. Well, we'll make sure we'll put a link to that, too, in the show notes to your books. How about that? <laughs> that sounds fine. I do have a full time job, though, so don't worry about it. Take care, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, David. See you, everybody. Take care.